Okay, um, welcome to the final London Digital Classicist Seminar of 2015. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce um, Sarah Hendricks, who is a researcher at CISPE, which is the International Centre for the Study of the Herculaneum Papyri. Um, Sarah did her first degree at uh, National University of, of the Australian National University at Canberra, um, did a master's um, at Oxford, uh, and is now researching as uh, something to do between uh, master's and PhD. And she's going to talk to us about digital technologies and the Herculean. Thank you. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to say thank you, Simon, and all the team involved in putting on this seminar, and thank you as well, Hugh, for the, uh, the lovely introduction. Um, Herculean papyrology is normally a rather small family, probably about the same size as this, if we're lucky, so it's nice to be able to share what we do with so many people. So thanks for coming today. Um, so the association between technological development and our ability to access and read the Herculaneum papyri began well before the digital age and the advent of digital technologies. The nature of the artifacts and their condition has meant that from their discovery, innovative approaches and new methodologies have always been instrumental in accessing their contents. For this reason, I would like to begin today by outlining briefly the early history of the papyri and the technological innovations that enabled us to access the texts of this library long before the digital age. In 1750, two farmers digging a well hit archaeological remains. At the time, with the recent discovery of Pompeii and the treasures that were being unearthed there, interest in such finds was high. The value, however, lay not in the unprecedented access to the ancient world, but rather in the physical riches that lay below, namely the statuary, mosaics, frescoes, and precious metals and jewellery. The two well diggers had discovered a belvedere, one outbuilding of an enormous villa. The structure was situated to the northwest of Herculaneum and originally lay parallel to the seashore on the Bay of Naples. In the following years, a number of excavations took place across the complex and the ancient city by means of a network of underground tunnels, and many valuable artifacts were removed. The Villa of the Papyri was extensively tunneled in all but the uppermost right corner of the building. Carl Weber, a Swiss engineer in charge of the excavations, set about to draw a plan of the villa based on his measurements and observations down in the tunnels. His plan, which you see here, remains one of the most comprehensive maps of the structure and has since informed digital reconstructions of the villa and replicas, notably Getty Villa in California. The excavators were under instruction to focus on extracting riches and material objects. Although some everyday objects were also kept, there was no impetus to keep everything. And so where multiple examples of one type of object were found, only the very best were preserved. Items such as food, wood, nets, and even cloth were deemed far too ordinary to be worth saving in large amounts, and many such items were discarded or trampled back into the earth. As you can see from this map, Herculaneum and Pompeii are situated on different sides of Vesuvius. This meant that when the volcano erupted in 79, it affected the two cities in slightly different ways. One notable outcome of this was that very large amounts of organic material were preserved at Herculaneum, a phenomenon that did not occur at Pompeii. Charred, black and charcoal though they may be, timber, fibres and yarns were left in their original form, along with the papyri. When the papyri were first discovered, they were not recognised for what they were. Just to hint, the papyri are the ones at the top. Instead, they were mistaken for old fishing nets, wound up pieces of cloth, or pieces of burnt timber. Due to their rather low value, they were tossed back into the ground or onto rubbish heaps. It was only when one of these charred blocks fell open and writing could be seen on the inside that their potential worth was recognised. Unsurprisingly, the value of an ancient library was immediately acknowledged, and care was given to salvage as many rolls as possible from the villa. In total, more than 1,800 separate papyri fragments or rolls were removed across five different locations. The man in charge of overseeing the operation was Carlo Paderni. Assisting him was Father Antonio Piaggio, the head of manuscripts from the Vatican Library, who was brought in due to the nature of the material. 
tension between the two men increased over the years as each had a very different approach to how the papyri should be handled and unrolled. Following the discovery of the rolls, the biggest question became quite simply how to unroll and read them. I dare say then, as today, dreams of famous lost works of ancient literature and early copies of classic works were rife. In the fervor to read these texts, various methods for opening the rolls took place, some more creative than others, and most highly destructive. Common methodologies involved attempts to rehydrate the rolls using various substances, including pure water, rose water, alcohol, and various types of oils. The rolls might be immersed in these solutions or wiped down with them. Alternatively, cloths soaked in the liquids might be wrapped around them or even just poured on top of an upended roll. <coughs> Another attempt involved fumigating the papyrus with a steam solution. In one case, with the interesting result that the script was identified as Oscan, in fact, the steam simply caused the ink to run. One of the more creative attempts involved immersing rolls in mercury in the hope that the heavier substance would seep between the pages and separate them. Pouring mercury over one end only served to crush it into a million pieces, and fumigating it with the substance had similarly disastrous results. Thankfully, these trials were ended sooner rather than later, though the exact number of rolls destroyed in such attempts is unknown. The most common method in its early years, however, was Paderni's knife, which is almost as destructive as it sounds, though unlike other attempts, did not, res did not result in complete annihilation of the roll. In order to open the rolls, most of which were encrusted in a hard casing of mud and debris, Paderni would cut the roll vertically down its length, creating two semicircular halves. The inner portion of these would then be scraped away until a long enough tract of text could be read. This process was soon modified so that only two cuts were made approximately two thirds of the way through either side. The outside portions were then lifted off and the innermost part of the roll left intact, as this image shows. The biggest breakthrough in reading the rolls came, however, through the innovation of Piaggio, the Vatican scholar. He cautioned against undue haste with the papyri and rather than turning to alchemy or brute force to open the rolls, instead devised a machine in 1753 that would enable the papyrus to be slowly unwound. By attaching the external surface of the papyrus to gold beater skin, a very thin membrane, he provided a flexible yet supportive base for the delicate papyrus. Using largely gravity, along with a hand-assisted mechanism, he gently prized each layer of papyrus away from the next using a small utensil. The results were remarkable, Papyrus rolls of many meters were unrolled in a single continuous stretch. There were limits to his technique, however. The process worked best only on the neatest and most well-preserved of the papyri. Also, Piaggio himself came under fire for the length of time his process took to complete. The first papyrus, P. Herc 1497, took a whole year to unroll. The world was impatient for results, then as now, and saw his method as unnecessarily painstaking. Despite the criticism, Piaggio's technique was used right up until the 20th century, when the emphasis on unrolling new rolls took a back seat. His technique still remains the best manual technique for unrolling the papyri, and despite greater understanding of the chemical and physical properties of the papyri, it's unlikely any better method will be devised. The vast majority of the around 1800 catalogued papyri have been unrolled using Piaggio's method. The results were certainly not the ones hoped for of the greats of classical literature, and instead an unusually large collection of Greek philosophical works, mostly by Philodemus, an Epicurean philosopher, were discovered along with around 120 largely unidentified Latin papyri. As mentioned, the papyri were carbonized when they were preserved. It is perhaps an irony that the process that enabled these papyri to come down to us is also the process that has made them so inaccessible. Their shape and form as rolls meant that they were more harshly affected on their outer layers. Often, this differentiation can be seen in the clarity of the text, which has a tendency to become clearer towards the center of the roll. I'll show you this from uh, one of the out towards the outside of a roll, and then this towards the very center. The two key challenges in working with the Herculaneum papyri are in finding the text on the papyrus, 
and then in working out where the pieces of text of the papyrus belong in relation to each other. The first, in actually discerning where the text is, is problematic due to the discoloration of the papyrus. As organic material will do when burnt, the papyri were charred to a dark black, in many instances very similar in colour to that of the ink. And here, I don't know if you can see closely enough, there is actually ink and papyrus in this image. Um, here's some ink and here's some papyrus to show you the contrast. In some papyri, and indeed in some parts of the same papyri, the contrast between ink and papyrus can vary, ranging from extremely clear to virtually invisible to the naked eye. The second challenge of working with the papyri is far more complex and challenging. When the papyri were carbonized, they became tightly compacted and absent of any moisture. This change in their physical state made the fibers extremely fragile and brittle. The reduction of moisture meant that the papyrus in effect shrank from its original size and form. And as part of this process, aided also by the presence of mud and ash, many of the layers of papyrus became fused together or so tightly compacted that it was impossible to separate them during the unrolling process. Unsurprisingly, this caused tears in the layer of the papyrus and resulted in fragments of papyri becoming separated from those to which they were once attached. The result is that the surface of the papyrus is now comprised of a series of undulating layers, or sotto and sovraposti, as it was impossible to unroll the papyri in clean sheets. These images here, this one in particular, you can see the various layers that all are on one sheet. While these layers are most visible on the surface of the papyrus, where only two layers are fused, it can be impossible to observe any distinction with the naked eye. And this becomes particularly problematic when reading the text because it makes it appear as it's one continuous line when in fact it actually belongs to two separate pages. Should the papyrus surface appear in a single flat sheet, text would be arranged evenly in columns. This looks lovely on this Greek one. It would not be unusual to find a subscriptio with the author and work at the end of the roll, and perhaps even a coronus to mark the end of the text. These traits can be easily discerned by the naked eye in the Greek papyri, since on the whole they are far clearer, far better preserved, and there are far more many, far more of them. A particular additional challenge in interrogating the Latin papyri, aside from their condition, is the relati relatively small amount of data we have on them. As they form only around 10% of the entire collection, and for their age are highly unique examples of Latin texts, there is a very small pool of data from which to draw conclusions or make comparisons. This means that unlike the Greek papyri, very few assumptions can be made about them, including their dimensions, layouts, and even content. There are a number of possible reasons, however, for these differences between the two types of papyri and the condition in which they have been preserved. It is possible that the texts were written on different types of papyrus sheets, that the papyrus was of a significantly different quality or age, or that they were in different parts of the villa and therefore affected differently during the eruption. Whatever the reason, the Latin papyri are known for their highly fragmentary state and are generally considered to be in much poorer condition than the Greek papyri. The value of technology is then, I feel, particularly relevant for the Latin papyri, since they have proven so resistant to traditional methods of examination. In fact, so resistant were they that by the 1990s, no Latin author had been conclusively identified, and Pihak 78, like almost every Latin papyrus, was classified as illegible. The 1970s marks the beginning of a new era and renewed interest in the Herculaneum papyri. The Centro Internazionale per lo Studio dei Papiri Herculanesi, or CISPA, easier to say, was established to assist in the research and dissemination of results on the papyri through their dedicated journal Chronica Herculanesi. Since then, scholars from around the world have travelled to Naples to access and work on the papyri. It was from this period that new techniques for unrolling the papyri were developed by a group of Norwegian scholars. Using modern chemical formulae and new materials, they were able to separate some layers of papyri that were previously in small stacks, though they were unable to meet with the same overarching success of the original manual Piaggio method. This was, however, due in part to the type of papyri still in need of this type of work. Those that had been left had been done so for a reason. 
Separate to physical experimentation on the papyri, this era also saw the re-examination of the previously unrolled papyri, inspired in part and certainly possible due to the new availability of microscopes, first introduced to the Officina di Papyri in 1971 by Eric Turner. Prior to this, transcriptions of the papyri were done on the basis of excellent eyesight, a healthy dose of knowledge, and some good, knowledge, some good logic. Unsurprisingly, due to the nature of the material, it was very easy to misread letters or to assign letters to different layers of the papyri. While the introduction of microscopes did not banish this impediment to reading the text entirely, it did enable scholars to examine difficult passages, letters, or segments far more closely. The earliest microscopes, however, had a single lamp that, while increasing visibility on one portion of the papyrus, also served to cast additional shadows across the rest of the undulating surface. It was not until the introduction of microscopes with annular lights in 1996 that these issues could be overcome. By the late 1980s, the focus was on ways in which to photograph the papyri, both for archival purposes, and there are some fantastic boxes of Polaroids uh, still in the office, and also for more detailed examination. Alongside these developments, there was a growing awareness in the power of computer-driven analytical tools related to imaging and textual reconstruction. In 1991, Dr. Claver wrote, computer methods have also been developed to produce concordances, <coughs> fill in text lacunas, and restore fragmentary letters. We hope that it will be possible before long to make these techniques practicable as well. It was said at the time that the special advantage of the methods is that the contrast between the carbonized papyrus and the black ink can be heightened. A computer with equipment for picture enhancement is also a helpful tool for making the handwriting distinct. These advances signaled the first big step away from the traditional methods of transcription and analysis. Drawing upon the newly available resources, the Norwegian scholar Kleber developed a new process for imaging the papyri and assisting in the transcription and editing of texts. His method involved capturing a series of microslides or highly magnified images across the entire papyrus. These slides were then projected on top of transparency paper alongside the microscope, and traces of visible, visible ink were marked out. The gaps between the fragments of ink were filled in, and images put together to form a length of text. On the basis of this methodology, three Latin works were identified within the collection. A book of Aeneas's Annales, multiple books of Lucretius's De Rerum Natura, and a comedy by the Roman playwright Caecilius Statius. The apparent success of the method suggested that this was the future of Herculaneum methodology, and by 1994, it was reported that about 10,000 microphotographs have so far been taken. They cover one half of the papyri. Care has been taken to spread the photos so that they give an impression of the papyri as a whole, and the goal is to have a photo collection where every square millimetre of the papyri is recorded. The sheer volume of work and time it would take to apply this method to the papyri was well noted at the time. It was said, decipherment is time consuming, taking photos, drawing pictures, reconstructing letters and restoring texts. The solution, however, had already been identified, and it was now firmly established that technological advances would hold the key for future investigations into the Herculaneum papyri. To make things easier and quicker, computer programs are being developed for producing word lists, searching for words, search for letter combinations, graphics for reconstructing letter fragments, and enhancement of photos. So by the mid-1990s, the way in which scholarship on the Herculaneum papyri was conducted had changed significantly. There was now a clear acknowledgement that technology would enable further studies to be conducted and would also assist scholars in saving time and potentially safeguarding the original materials. Interestingly, the mid-90s also marks a change in technological development itself. The period from that point has been marked by ever more rapid developments in technological capabilities and resources, and perhaps far more significantly, the availability of these resources to a far broader audience. By way of an example for how technology has been a direct influence on Herculaneum scholarship, I would now wish to turn to a case study. 
that of Pehr 78, the so-called Caecilius Statius Oblastate Sigue Finerato. This papyrus is, I feel, a particularly good example of how work on the papyri and findings can be radically altered by developments in technology. When it was first unrolled, it was deemed to be illegible. In the 1990s, it was identified by work and author, and text was transcribed using the microslide method. Since this time, new types of imaging have emerged, and the latest findings suggest that the papyrus may not, in fact, even be in verse, let alone be a plague by Caecilius Statius. <laughs> the next portion of my paper will therefore explore the history of this particular papyrus and outline the most recent findings. P. Herc 78 was originally unrolled in the early 19th century using the Piaggio method. From this process, eight sheets of papyrus were preserved. Although still not as clear as the Greek papyri, P. Herc 78 has much clearer text than many of the other Latin papyri, and it is probably for this reason that it was the focus of further studies in the late 20th century. Using the microslide method, a series of drawings and reconstructions from across the papyrus were made. In particular, attention was focused on the final coniche, or sheet, of the papyrus, since a partial title was thought to be preserved. This is the final sheet of the papyrus. In 1996, it was published as Caecilius Statius's Obelus Dante Siwe Finerato. In addition to the partial subscriptio, which had been reconstructed, uh, the word plavite, traditionally used to signal the end of a play, was found just prior to the title, let me give you some bearings here, um, followed by what seemed to be a Baronus. So this part of the text here, this is the start of Claudite, <coughs> here. Um, the Coronus, which is this, is somewhere around here. Um, the Caecilius is there. The Obelostartes is along there. And the Edda <coughs> comes about here. And the rest, it's in relation. So tracts of text from Corniche 6 and Corniche 8 were transcribed, and on the basis of these reconstructions, a hypothetical plot was put forward. I quote it here. The main plot seems to be a love story between a young man and the girl Zixtillus, who is in the clutches of Alina. The young man borrows money from a fine orator to ransom Zixtillus, and ends up in a huge debt which he is unable to pay. The sweethearts are pestered both by the Lino and the fine orator, but helped by a cunning slave and possibly a parasite, Lokes, who as a fake magician assists the superstitious fine orator in his numerous sacrifices. The sweethearts are further opposed by the young man's father and elder brother, who wants the family property for himself. But the situation changes when Sistilus turns out to be freeborn, and action can be brought against the Lino for illegal enslavement. The play ends up with a wedding scene and a request for, for applause. So since the mid-90s, this has remained the predominant theory on the contents of PHEC 78. The challenges presented by the papyrus itself, along with the availability and development of new methodologies, meant that further work on the papyrus has been largely undone. In 1999, an important trial, which included PHEC 78, was undertaken by representatives of the Center for the Preservation of Ancient Religious Texts, affiliated with Brigham Young University. Based on positive results from the Petra papyri, multispectral images were also taken of the Herculaneum collection. The process, which involves taking a series of images through various filters across a spectrum of light, aims to, to find a point at which text and papyrus are in the greatest contrast. The results far exceeded expectations, and Kleber, on examination of the images, wrote, the quality of the images lies far above that of hitherto available conventional photographs of the papyri. An electronic presentation of the texts also opens for enlargements and other enhancements at Levitum. On the basis of these positive results, MSIs were taken of the entire collection. Their appeal lay not only in their quality and potential value to scholars, but also in their potential contribution to the preservation of the papyri. As Kaleva said, it would mean a real progress for the study of the papyri outside the Opicina, and the papyri themselves could be spared deterioration by handling and shuffling. Scholars' visits to the Opicina might be reduced to just control reading. 
While this has been possible for large numbers of the papyri, in particular the Greek ones, the stratigraphic challenges of the Latin papyri pose a particular set of challenges. On one hand, the MSIs have made text visible in a way that was not previously possible. And here I show you the contrast of the original papyrus and then the MSI next to it. Equally, however, as 2D images, they are prone to a number of shortcomings. For the Latin papyri, and P. Herc 78 in particular, the stratigraphic challenges are heightened since different layers of the papyrus do not show up clearly on the image. And this is an, another MSI image, um, but there are actually changes in layer all down here, across this slide, this piece is separated, as is that portion up there and various of these other cracks have small numbers as well. So last April, I took up a boss of the studio with Chisper in Naples to undertake further research on this papyrus. I was in the fortunate position to have at my disposal not only Flavor's original findings on the papyrus, but also full access to the MSIs and the papyrus <coughs> itself, a combination I found to be absolutely requisite. More than 20 years after its initial identification, I undertook to re-examine the papyrus and draw upon all the innovations of those intervening years in the original hope of adding new text to this otherwise unknown work by one of the greats of ancient comedy. I began by assessing each of the eight corniche visually without the use of any other materials or mechanisms, as was the original approach to Herculaneum scholarship. It was clear from the outset that the condition of the corniche were worse towards the beginning of the rule and the text was clearer towards the end. Given that the bulk of material already published was on Corniche 8, I focused my attentions on this final piece. I also realised that the more technological help I could find, the better. Turns out there was a reason that it was once called illegible. Corniche 8 has always been the focal point of studies on this papyrus, largely due to the identification, as outlined earlier, of the partial subscriptio and coronas. The corniche does not preserve the total height of the papyrus, but is rather in two separate petsi, each of which has two separate segments that are joined together by gold beater skin. Each petso is a long horizontal band of papyrus, and the two petsi are laid, as you can see, one above the other. In previous examinations of the papyrus, it had always been assumed that the petsi were mounted so as to retain their original positioning relative to each other. In an effort to double check everything, I set about to ascertain the exact positioning of these two pieces. Petso 9, the upper piece, preserves an upper margin, while Petso 10 has text at both its upper and lower extremities. This suggests that the two pieces, taken together, comprise the top two thirds of the papyrus. Further evidence to support this arrangement can be seen on other corniche to this one, six here, which contain cracks in the papyrus where you can see the, cor the corniche is divided into three horizontal bands. The upper and lower of these are both around seven to eight centimeters, while the middle band is only 6.5 centimeters. Petso 9 is 7.5 centimeters and Petso 10 6.5. So the measurements of these final two pieces seem to accord to the scheme and further evidence for being the upper two thirds of the papyrus the lower third in this segment appears not to have been preserved. So based on these measurements, the vertical positioning of the two petsi is secure, but what about the horizontal positioning? As preserved, the lower petso takes the entire width of the sheet to which it is affixed, and petso 9 is positioned as far to the right as possible on the cartoncino. There are no notes or records to consult to determine if this positioning was done for a particular reason, so it cannot be assumed it is the correct alignment. Typically, when trying to match pieces of Herculaneum papyri, physical markers are sought out that are likely to appear on both pieces. These might be calices, where two sheets of papyrus are stuck together, forming a seam, the beginning of a column of text, the end of a column of text, partial letters that match together like a jigsaw puzzle, or circumference measurements. A cylinder, when it is rolled and then squashed, when unrolled again, we'll have a series of creases gradually getting closer together the further towards the middle of the roll you get. On the Herculaneum papyri, it can be possible to observe these same creases. And where it is possible to get accurate measurements, calculations can then be made as to the relative positioning of pieces of papyrus within a roll. 
A key hindrance to using this technique on the Latin papyri is the complex stratigraphy, which tends to obscure any such markers. Indeed, initially this seemed also to be the case with p 78. After much perusing of both the MSIs and the papyrus under the microscope, I discovered part of a letter on Hetzo 10 that was on an upper layer, and when moved 5.8 centimeters to the right, attached to another partial letter to form a complete whole. Let me give you some more bearings. <laughs> so this piece up here, you can see a small stroke and then it has a slight cap. If you move that directly over here, you get the top of this letter with the cap. And to verify it, this piece here as well, you see part of, uh, of a vertical here with a crossbar. If you take that over, it fits perfectly into here to give us an E. So finding these types of matches uh, enabled me in this instance to make an exact measurement of a circumference of the roll at this point. To do this, I also used digital calipers rather than a traditional ruler, as they enabled a much greater level of accuracy. And so once this one circumference measurement had been ascertained, I was able to identify the patterns <coughs> in the surrounding papyrus that enabled other circumference measurements to be made. This meant that I then had a series of measurements that decreased at regular intervals across the papyrus piece, PETSO 10. I then set about doing such measuring on PETSO 9 and looking for similar patterns, increases, and tears on the surface. After many, I'd like to say hours, but realistically it's more like days or weeks, I found a matching pattern with the same decreasing series of measurements. After aligning the two pieces so that the measurements matched up, it was obvious that the two pieces had not been affixed in their original positions. Instead, Petzo 9 had been positioned in order to form a straight edge on the right-hand side of the carton chino, and its original position was 9.3 centimeters further to the left. Unsurprisingly, the subscriptio of PHEC 78 has frequently been the focus of discussion on this papyrus. With the repositioning of Petzo 9 to its original position, as you can see here, any ink that had been ascribed to the subscriptio from this Petzo can now be shown to belong to the previous section of text. Indeed, this positioning provides answers to many outstanding questions about the subscriptio, such as why the letters appeared to be so similar in size, why there was only a few millimetres between the supposed final column of text and the subscriptio, and why it appeared to conform to the same dimensions as the rest of the work. So the only chance of recovering any part of the subscriptio is, therefore, in whatever ink can be found in Petso 10. Unfortunately, this piece had always contained less of the supposed subscriptio than Petso 9, and based on the layout, it does, however, seem highly likely that any ink ascribed to the subscriptio from this piece does indeed belong to it. The positioning of the final letters, only partway through the line, and not at the bottom of the column, suggests that it was indeed the end of the text, which would mean any text after this is the subscriptio. Unfortunately, there are only two traces of ink, and they preserve only fragments of letters that cannot be reconstructed. And furthermore, they in turn belong to separate layers. So it is tantalizing to think that the ink of the subscriptio survives, but that there is no hope of discerning any usable text from it. So using Photoshop, I created this digital recreation of the original positioning of the Petsy, and as we can see, the uppermost portion of the final section is now empty. Although an immense setback to the claim that it was calculus the reconstruction alone was not enough. It was clear to me that being able to ascertain the physical layout of the text would be of immense benefit, even if that text was not itself particularly visible. So to do this, I focused on the ink that could be seen on the papyrus surface. The MSIs of the papyrus show relatively clear and relatively continuous text on around half the corniche and are extremely useful in bringing out the contrast between ink and papyrus. As you can see on here, there's quite a number of traces of ink. However, as already noted, the MSIs can be problematic when it comes to questions of layers. After trying to transcribe any text from the MSIs alone, I soon realized it would be impossible to do this accurately without also having the original papyrus at hand, as well as a system for noting where the changes in layer occurred. My first attempt to overcome this was with Photoshop. 
And using an MSI of the Koniche, I attempted to draw around each layer break and separate them into different literal layers. Since many of the layers were so small and so close together, and since it was impossible to work out as I went along which layer should belong where, it soon became totally feasible and practical to accurately manage such an image. And I admit, I went old school. I printed out the MSI of the Koniche at a two to one ratio and glued it to a piece of card. With the computerized MSI in front of me for magnification, the original papyrus under the microscope in front of me, and my new printout next to me, I set about tracing out the layers with a pen. Systematically covering the papyrus, I traced over any ink that was visible, drew around every layer change, and made small notes as to which layers belonged where. Time consuming and tedious, yes, but infinitely helpful in determining the topography of the papyrus and its text. And this is what it looks like. So once this was completed, it was easy to make out key places where layers could be matched together using a color code and then set about shading out the different layers. It turns out primary school coloring between the lines is good for something after all. <laughs> what emerged was a pattern of text that had completely con obscured on the images and the original papyrus. This is a form of here. And looking at the association of text and color and even distribution of text emerged, and it was possible to determine that Cornici 8 has three columns of text, each around 9.5 centimeters in width, with a 2.5 centimeter <coughs> columnia. Shall I give you some more, some more points of reference? This is the end of the column. These blue pieces are all the same level. So you have a column through here, a gap, another column, another gap, and then a third column down here. It had been known, or at least very strongly suspected, that the Latin papyri have much larger dimensions than the Greek ones. This, however, is the first time that such reliable measurements have been found, and sure enough, they confirm the hypothesis. Furthermore, it's now possible to draw conclusions as to the layout and size of the text itself. Across all eight sheets, there is a consistent upper margin of at least five centimeters. The bottom margin is more difficult to situate, but on Corniche 2 appears to be at least 3 centimetres. The bulk of the text itself is approximately 0.4 centimetres in height, with around 1 centimetre from the base of one line of text to the next. Measurements taken across the Corniche at various positions within the column demonstrate that this is consistent across the remaining papyrus. Based on this and the existing traces of text, it can be surmised that there were roughly 20 lines of text per column. 20 lines at one centimeter plus the margins gives us a minimum height for the papyrus at 27 centimeters. With the textual layout now established, I was able to focus on the remaining evidence for the attribution of calculated stations. Based on the layout, it was very much the case that the plaudite and the coronas are at the end of a section of text, halfway down a column. Um, so you can see this from the colour, um, that the text continues further along in this direction. Um, and that this is the coronas, the finishes halfway through. The coronas had always been a key feature of the papyrus, and I was keen to examine its shape and position. This is it in the centre. Uh, corona dates are not usual, unusual, I should say, in the papyri, although this one has a remarkably different look to those that appear in the Greek papyri, by way of comparison. Examination of the MSIs in the original papyrus under high magnification indicated nothing new about the sign, but given its position on the papyrus, it was very difficult to manipulate the corniche in such a way as to enable me to see the sign from a very raked angle, which is necessary for seeing the stratigraphy. Luckily, I have an iPhone, and I was able to download a free program which created a 3D image from a set of uploaded photographs, um, which I took off this point, and I had desperately hoped to be able to bring up the 3D image that I had and show it for you, but they're having a problem with their server. Funnily enough, that technological problems have prevented me from, uh, from using this in my talk about the technology. But anyway, I have them on my phone, so if afterwards anyone wants to see them, I can show them to you. Um, so although a basic model, this image still enabled me to manipulate the papyrus in a manner that was just not possible in the flesh. And from this I could see that there was in fact a very small piece of papyrus obscuring some ink just underneath the coronas. 
The traces of ink around it and the shape of the extra piece indicated clearly that hidden from sight was a vertical stroke joining the last flourish of the coronas. With this restored, it becomes apparent that the coronas is in fact two letters, R and S. It was perhaps unfortunate that the replacement of the coronas with the letter RS subsequently meant the abandonment of Plaudite. The confirmation that it was text, however, and its positioning almost at the end of the line of column, with no further ink below, is nevertheless an indication that this is indeed the end of the work. It had also been suggested that lines throughout the papyrus are completed with distinction marks or slash signs, and that these are present in at least four of the five extant lines at the end of the play. The signs are most typically used in verse and appear at the end of every line of the Bello Actiacum. P. Herc 817. Because a line of verse can vary greatly in length, it is the general, and indeed for this period perhaps the abiding rule, that prose texts are justified in their columns, while verse texts have a jagged edge and may employ such distinction marks. Naturally, this seemed a key aspect of the papyrus's composition worth investigating. Returning to my map, um, I examined the endings of columns where visible, and so far I have been unable to find a single distinction mark. In fact, most of the columns seem to end in quite uniform regularity, and for this reason I'm led to believe that the text is in fact a work of prose rather than poetry. So at this point it may seem that everything is in place to sit down and happily transcribe away at this new work of Latin literature, and oh how I wish it was so. Though thanks to technological resources such as the MSIs and 3D modeling, it's now possible to show where the columns are, what is left of the subscriptio, and even where the text actually is. But there's still one very important challenge to be muddled through, and that is the paleography. This script of 78 is quite unusual and combines elements of scripts seen in the Pompeii graffiti right through to epigraphic forms. A large part of the work now is in consolidating what the alphabet of this papyrus actually looks like, so that text can be described accurately even when only scraps and traces of letters remain. But despite this somewhat bleak outlook, it has been possible to transcribe a few key words across the papyrus, including hostes, we have an inquit aliquam, an aliquam du, and perhaps most notably, an incustra and a reduxit exercitum. So although highly fragmentary, it seems clear that even from this very small vocabulary, and when taken into consideration the work is laid out as expected for a prose text, that it is almost certainly historical in nature. So far, no textual match has shown up in any of the known databases, and there are too few indications to make a suggestion of, of an author on stylistic grounds. It is a strange position to be in, on the one hand, the developments in imaging of the past 15 years have enabled a far closer examination of this papyrus than has previously been possible. On the other, this type of examination has meant that everything we thought we knew about the papyrus has been called into question. My consolation is that technological developments continue to make great strides forward, and that with further patience, and perhaps yet another renewed examination in years to come, further progress may yet be made on this and the other Herculaneum papyri. I would like to finish with two brief further points. And the first is to look at the future of the technology and the Herculaneum papyri. As noted, new modes and methods of research are being developed all the time, but at present there are two that I would like to mention in particular today, because I believe these are the two that will have the greatest impact on the way in which we study the papyri. And the first is RTI imaging. And here we feature our dear Ms. Catherine Bicketts who I believe gave a talk on this very topic in this series last year. Uh, in short, and she will know far better than I, it's a combination of 3D and MSI imaging that enables full digital manipulation of a complete rendering of the papyrus. This combination would enable scholars to continue accessing all the benefits of the MSIs in a format that enables physical manipulation of the object away from the papyrus itself. Although the papyri are, in essence, texts on a page, the way in which they have been preserved means that they are, in fact, 3D material objects, and to a certain extent, they must be examined as such. While we cannot extract text from a side on view of a papyrus sheet, the arrangement of the papyrus from that perspective can enable us to make significant and certainly logical choices in the arrangement of the text contained thereon. 
Furthermore, these types of images go one step further to solving the issue of conservation. Where the MSIs on their own provided only 2D images that still need much physical control reading, especially for the Latin ones and almost always for strength graphic issues, Antiodes would also enable the first stages of control reading to be done away from the papyri, thus decreasing the amount of time they are in use. The other avenue, of course, is X-ray tomography. This year we've seen the first results that hint at the potential to read these rules without even needing to unroll them. It is an exciting prospect. As is apparent from the history of her the Herculaneum papyri, attempts to read them have always had a destructive element from the earliest knife cuts, through even to the slow disintegration of the physical materials as they are moved between their storage cases and the workbenches. My personal hope for this type of imaging lies more so with those papyri that have already been unrolled. As a papyrologist, I can tell you there is nothing more frustrating than to see part of a word disappear under a layer of papyrus and know the only way to read it would be by destroying the layer above. X-ray tomography may yet enable us to read the layers on those papyri that have already been unrolled. To use PHERP 78 as an example once more, based on the circumference measurements of the papyrus, the intervening length between the first and the last corniche that are preserved is at least 7.5 meters over more than 65 layers. At most, we are only able to see around 2.4 meters of this at the present time. Looking at the stratigraphy of the Corniche, I would be very happy to say that the vast majority of the, of the papyrus is still there, albeit sandwiched in thick layers of papyri. If this technology were able to scan each layer, it would be possible not only to read the text, but, re but to reconstruct vast sections of the work. It would be very easy, however, to slip into the same fervor of our 18th century counterparts and construct grand visions of finding lost Livy or new plays by Seneca. Then given what we've already found, this perhaps seems rather unlikely, and doubtless caution should well be exercised. But this potential fervor brings me to my final point, and that is to remember that no matter how the technology evolves or can assist the papyrologist, there will always be an element of human interaction or intervention in the creation of these systems or perhaps more importantly, in the interpretation of the results. As one scholar once remarked, one shortcoming of many earlier efforts towards reproducing the text of the Herculaneum papyrus was the unavoidable intervention of individual judgment in the process. But even with the advent of photography, the anti-photogenic nature of the papyri themselves resisted scholars' efforts to show with their publications the texts they were editing. As technology becomes more and more sophisticated, it seems that these challenges are being slowly overcome. There is an exciting future ahead for Herculaneum papyrology, and it is my hope and belief that with further PR style patients, that these texts will continue to yield up their secrets and eventually become legible once again. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was wonderful and a really clear presentation of what's been done and what, some hints of what may be done. Um, I'm going to start by asking you a question, a sort of question one shouldn't probably ask in a digital um, humanities um, seminar. But given I mean, the, the message of your talk seemed to be that the key technologies for deciphering texts like this were paper, scissors, and colored pens. And that the, and, and, then, the, and then most importantly of all, the human eye reading, reading what's produced. So um, possibly uh, x-ray tomography may help to, to look under the layers. But do you think that, I mean, are, there, are those things that can be digitized, or do you think it's actually always going to be easier, given that piece of paper you can spread over a table? And, screens don't tend to be that, that large, that, that that actually is is going to continue to be sort of, you know, that, 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 that physical technology, old, very old-fashioned, technology almost as old as the virus is actually as important as... 
I think certainly at, at this time, I was aware when I read back over my paper that it sounded very much like technology is great, but still pen and paper every day. But um, no, I think uh, I think my view on this is the types of technologies that are being developed now will enable that level of work to be done. Um, but my feeling is that the types of, um, of work that we've had available, the 2D imaging, um, the micro slides, were almost not sophisticated enough to be able to take the place of what we could do. Um, and certainly the shortcomings in effect of, the te of those technologies, which are only becoming apparent now, are what's causing us to then go back and have a look at what was found using those technologies. Um, my feeling is that those that are being developed from this point on are sophisticated enough that we're not going to need to second guess those types <coughs> of results. But I think there will always be an element for the human aspect in this, um, especially when you're working with collections of texts that we don't have so far. Um, so to a certain extent, working out what's likely to come next or matching things in a database is quite difficult where it's never been put into a yeah. database to yeah. begin with. Yeah. So there's a certain amount, so to a certain extent, I think the human element will always be important in this, but I think we can start to trust the technology to a far greater extent now than we have been able to. And the, the, so the, the bits, I mean, the 3D image requires getting, presumably quite risky access to, to the material. I mean, if you're going to take into it's much more, you can't, it's not simply looking at them, you, you, you've got to be sort of manipulating the material more. What do you um, think? Or is to that a not? certain extent, though, I believe um, the way that some of it, and Catherine will know better than I on some of these elements, is that the a lot of the equipment now is being designed to actually leave the papyri as well alone as possible. Yeah. Um, and of course, the follow through with that is the benefit of if we do it well now, we can quite literally leave them well enough alone for a long time yeah. to come. Okay, thank you. Question? Yes. Oh, uh, two things. First of all, has your iPhone got a lightning adapter? Uh, a lightning port? Yes. Because uh, I've got a video adapter, not a screen. Oh, we can try it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so the research that I did was while I um, was in receipt of a borsa from Chispa. Um, and so because this was the, the results of the research that um, came out from that period, then um, they will all be published in Chronica Berkelinesi. Um, so keep an eye on the journal um, forthcoming. So that's, that's where it will be submitted. Um, I dare say it will be up to their editorial review team and so on to, to make final decisions, but that's the current plan for it. But none of that comes out of the writing. Can you tell, obviously, pre-79, how before, far before pre-79 was written down? Is it That's one of the big or? questions. <laughs> um, no, especially with the Latin ones, we have great difficulty in dating. Um, this is not to say that there haven't been schemes put forward and there aren't some um, ideas for how to break up the dating based on the paleography. Um, but in short, with such a small number of examples to go from, it's very difficult to come up with anything conclusive. Um, this one we generally seem to think is from probably the middle to the second half of the first century BC. Um, but again, they're very, they're very basic steps that we're using in terms of um, in terms of how to actually sort um, the hands that we have. Um, but it's one of the things that's currently under research. Um, and we're hoping, or my hope with further um, research that I'm undertaking is that by being able to extract more of the text using processes like this, that once we have more content, we've then got something to relate the paleography to rather than looking simply at the letter forms. So in short, it's a work in progress. And compared to the Greek? Text, what sort of data do oh, the Greek, the Greek ones. I think someone told me the earliest one is sixth century BC. We mm -hmm. have some very, there's one that's really? meant to be. That's what I thought sounded outstanding to me. Um, but I believe most of them are meant to be second century, first century. They're certainly generally older than, than the Latin ones, and there's much more um, solid dating of those than the Latin texts. The, the Lucretius there is important, isn't it? Because that's the one that uh, you know, we, we have more of a kind of window. How does that hand in 78 compare with the Lucretius? Unbelievably similar. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Are we sure it's still Lucretius? Uh, no, we're sure it's Lucretius. Or uh, well, we can sure it's Another question. Sorry, I should clarify. I think it was the papyrus rather than the hand. That was that early date. So, so you talked to me. Or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the papyrus the material as opposed to the hand oh, that sorry. was the early date. So it's actually material of sixth century BC. Yes, not that. Yeah, I think that was the that was the distinction. I'm mm -hmm. Trying to call back. And Philodemus would be about second century BC. Yeah. But some of the texts are much earlier. They're not. Philodemus is not the earliest author that we have. No. So. Yes, you did say for early on. Some of the papyri were many meters long. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, what is it many meters? But if you could convert it into a book, how many pages would the book have, so to speak? Well, I mean, <laughs> just for a roughly idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, there are. Uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Okay. Um, many meters can be anything from, I think many of the papyri rolls are around 8 to 12 meters. Some look like they may be up to 16 meters in length. Um, so in terms of the actual length, um, for the Greek ones, you're only looking, you're looking at not as high as the Latin ones. Um, so you're still getting a significant amount of text in there. Um, you're certainly getting whole books within oh. ancient literature works. Originally, 78 was thought to only have about 500 verses in it, but based on um, the, the letter dimensions and the widths and so on, it looks to have about 1,200 lines, so to be a complete book of the work. I remember that um, there's a couple published from the Getty, mm -hmm. which is about the library of uh, a papyrus, and uh, I think in the plan, they indicated where the papyrus was found in, in this room and so on. Mm -hmm. So do you have a database of this particular papyri was found in this room or? <laughs> so we have a general idea, you're right. There are five locations where the papyri yeah. were found. And um, 
we know to some extent which papyri were in which locations, but we don't, because of the way in which they were excavated, mm -hmm. um, records weren't kept at the time, the cataloging system, the mm -hmm. numerical catalog that we have for them, mm -hmm. wasn't done at the time of excavation. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say with certainty this papyrus was this location, this one was that one. Um, which is why we look to things like similarities in the condition that they're in or perhaps the size and we try and we try and match in that way where it's not possible otherwise. Um, this is kind of the basis of why we think some are in better condition than others. We would love to have that catalogue, but unfortunately <coughs> it doesn't exist. Can I go back to the you to the X ray tomography that you talked about at the end? Yes. And you were saying that you thought it probably had more application to the already un unrolled stuff, because mm -hmm. you can read between two or three layers. But presumably, does that mean that if something is still completely rolled up, such as the illustration you had, it's probably not going to be possible to? Oh, I think it will it. certainly be possible eventually, absolutely. And it will certainly have a value from that perspective. Um, I, my feeling with its value in terms of what we have already unrolled is that we already have such insight and such access to the unrolled ones in terms of we know the text, we can, we can reconstruct such large portions of it. Um, and well, of course, it's going to be fabulous to eventually be able to just digitally unroll one and read mm. it you know, in perfect columns. Um, in terms of the number of papyri that we have that we've you know, unrolled, tried to edit and so on, to be able to actually fill in the gaps of some of these, I think. Right, so in, it, it's a, in terms of, as it were, the usefulness of them, in the short term, it's it's useful to go over. Well, since you've demonstrated that the hex seventy eight is utterly not what it was thought to be, then yes, yeah. there must be other cases. Yes, so it, it's it's about practicality, right? Yeah. In the in the short term, right? Yes. 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 Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, in terms of uh, looking at the Brigham Young University multispectral mm. um, image data, did you ever notice that they were able to get? Um, ink that wasn't on the revealed surface, were you ever able to see through a layer at all, or was it purely only I could never see through the uppermost layer where you're getting contrast? It seems to only be the uppermost, but there is certainly um, sections on the uppermost that appear to be completely blank just because the ink is so sort of faded, um, but then it comes out in the images. Um, and if you look closely enough, whether it's you know the mind's eye playing tricks, you think you could then see maybe where the shadow once was. Um, but I haven't ever seen anything where it comes from a layer below. Okay, good. Because uh, in working on them, mm -hmm. you know, this was something that I couldn't see either. But there will be a project starting up at UCL, UCL Center for Digital Humanities, headed up by Melissa Terrace, and I'm on board with that. And what we're going to be doing is working on papyri um, cartonage. Um, but it's a similar problem and that we're going to test different techniques starting in September. Well, results will be coming in you know, the following year but to see how far below we can detect mm -hmm. um, below that primary layer. And of course, we're doing plaster, adhesives, paint, and other things. But if we are able to solve this problem to some degree, um, then this will, of course, have applicability to the Hurricane mm -hmm. and the Pirates. So, um, using what technology? Well, there'll be a range of different um, imaging um, Techniques applied to to the cartonage just to see how, how far we can penetrate and what, where the real problems lie, or where we have to then turn to the work that Brent Seals and others have been doing with the rolled up rolls, where that may be the only answer. But hopefully, we can get down a few a few areas. But uh, yeah, yeah, stay tuned in that respect as well. Yeah. Presumably, there's no other ink ever than the carbon ink. Um. I had read that there were some plant-based inks, but I don't believe they're present in the Herculaneum papyri. So, thank you for a fascinating talk, and uh, as you said, we were very, very fortunate to have Catherine talking about the Herculaneum papyri last year. Two years before that, we had Ryan Fowler, who is exactly talking about the CT scanning through the, the unrolled sections of it. So yeah. that, I don't think we have that on video, but we certainly have it on audio with the slides if you look in the, in the web page on there. Um, I was going to say, I, I've never um, heard anybody talk about the, the idea about using the CT scanning for the you know, two or three sort of layers on that. So that sounds like it's got a great deal of promise to go with that one. But the, the, the one of the problems you're addressing, if I understand it right, this sort of gravity pull thingy has misplaced 
yeah? Or I don't know, whatever the technical word is for. The bits have moved around when they put it down there. Okay. So what you are really, one of the things that you're struggling with is repositioning them. I really like your, your pen and paper and the, I do exercises with my students with, with highlighter pens for colouring in and things like this on things. Um, so I think the mixture of the old school and the technology is, is always the way to go. But what I was thinking of was um, a program that will allow you to snip up the various bits of the, the image of the papyri that you've got and physically move them around. So you have like a virtual jigsaw. Yeah. And there's, there's as Catherine mentioned, this new project that we have um, at UCLDA up the road. But there's one from several years ago examining the theory of frescoes. Mm-hmm. And it's by one of our, um, our deputy directors in the computer science department. And the problem that they're struggling with is these are the frescoes that have you know, impacted with the, with the thing. So the bits don't match. Yeah? So it's like a jigsaw puzzle, but the edges don't fit yeah. together. So what they've been looking at is, is algorithms to, to look at the patterns, yeah? yes. to virtually put them back in the right order by looking not at the edges, because they're not going to match, but the shapes. And putting those sort of two things together may be an idea for allowing the, the bits of script to be manipulated in sort of the, I don't know, the right order, in, in the order that your eyes tell you is, is more appropriate. No, yeah. absolutely. Something yeah. like that would actually be incredibly useful even for us because even when after it's been carbonized, you can see quite clearly the fibers still yeah. of the papyrus. Um, and often that's the only way to match up two layers when there's a big gap is seeing the same pattern in fiber distribution on both sides. Um, so it is, in theory, possible to do <coughs> that also for these. Um, where having the combination of the full sort of X-ray 3D underneath side would be that you'd be able to look at the vertical fibers as mm. well as the horizontal fibers on the top. Mm. Um, so being able to get both of those would be wonderful. Yeah, that would give you another way another of aligning the virtual bits, getting the getting the lines in the right order. Yeah? Yes. And you've got to get them moved up. Yeah. I'm um, sorry, I can just ask Catherine, is, is yeah. Stephen down at, quite down at the peak tree? Because they've been doing some work on imaging papyri, looking at the, the different ways in which the papyri are constructed. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that might be helpful as well. Did they, did yes, they I think they were using a flat he was doing that with Tim as well. scanner and Im- yeah. imaging it, scanning it one direction and the other direction because of the offset on the head, right. well, at least yeah. a lower quality scanner. Yeah. That offset, that misalignment is of use and actually can give you 3D information. Yeah, that's it. So that they're actually looking at the, the fibers. Uh, one of the, the questions they were looking at was, um, I think Stephen was interested in what was written, right? But Tim was interested in the quality of the papyrus. And are the legal documents written on better quality papyri than the sort of household or administrative list, this, this type of thing? So they were examining the actual structure of the papyri, which may help with the alignment as well. Yeah. Tim. Uh, <coughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, I think you mentioned that the, the Latin uh, scrolls were larger than the Greek ones. Mm-hmm. You said you confirmed something. I wonder if you were confirming that generally that they were large, or this particular sheet was larger. And, and well, so, so, well, what, what, why, why do you think it is the Latin ones were bigger? So we have um, a partial catalogue uh, from the late 18th century that gives the dimensions of all the fragments. Um, and all the rolls. And so from those, we've been able to see that some that turned out to be the Latin ones seem to be of a much greater size to begin with anyway. Um, separate to the physical, actual structure of the roll, um, from the pieces of Latin that we have been able to see, the text is of a larger size, the formatting is of a larger size in general, um, in terms of the actual column, the layout, everything about it is just bigger. The margins are bigger, you name it. Um, but as I was saying, we also have so few examples in anywhere across even the Herculaneum collection. And one of the things that we really don't have any um, real examples of are the column widths. Um, and so that's where this one in particular is of use because now we can actually say this is actually what a column width is. Look, we have a start, we have an end, which believe it or not, I think only occurs once or twice else in all of the Latin ones in Herculaneum. Um, so, while it's tempting to then say, yes, this is what it was, um, I'm loath to make that on the basis of one um, piece of analysis.
analysis. But it's something that I'm looking at at the moment is actually doing this type of work on all the Latin papyri to try and see if we can get just these physical layouts and say something more about the dimensions more solidly. There's nothing in the, in, in the literature about writing which would suggest why Latin writing is bigger than Greek writing or the dimensions. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there are many reasons and hypotheses that have been put forward as to why. Um, I think the interesting thing for us is seeing the literary library of this period um, is actually the unique thing. So um, having the evidence in the physical side to then apply to these reasons and ideas. Um, and the thing that I'm quite interested in is seeing if there are different layouts and different formatting and different concepts according to the genre of the work that's actually. Um, which again, for the age and the type, we just don't have the data available to be able to say much about it at the moment. So to answer the question, you mentioned I mentioned a couple of slides ago. Um, but at the beginning, you mentioned only 10% of the texts are Latin. Um, when you have an equal Latin and Greek library, you expect there to be a bigger percentage. I knew Latin. someone would come to this. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, a wonderful talk, and I haven't got to you about this. I'm, <laughs> I'm interested are that when they excavated in the 18th century, and the report's not very good in that period, did they finish excavating the Latin Library? And if they didn't, is there yet more text to discover? Uh, or have they been disintegrated? Have they not been more careful? So there are, there are numerous factors at play in this in this debate. Um, so one of the things I did mention at the start with the different types of experiments they did on the opening the rolls, we don't know how many were actually just destroyed in that process. Um, we don't know how many were um, trodden, thrown away, destroyed by excavators, then by the initial investigations. Um, and aside from not knowing the number, we then don't know what percentage of those were the Latin ones. Um, logic would say, if you're going to do experiments, you do them on the ones that look the cleanest and the neatest and the ones that look like will give you the best results. If they were the Latin ones, because of where they were, then they're the ones that are going to have gone initially. So hence, you'd expect a higher percentage of Latin ones compared to Greek. The other flip side of all of this, though, is that, um, I'm not sure if you made it for the initial plans of the villa, and there's a corner that hasn't yet been excavated. That's that's a big question. Is that corner where the Latin library is? So cool if we find it. It would be lovely, but uh, I'm yeah, I'm not sure that we'll. Because you've got more work. Though, unless uh, we've got more than enough to go with now, yeah. but um, but I think also unless our X-ray abilities can go beneath the ground as well as through the, uh, through the I'm not sure we'll ever go get that. So so we're not quite sure. Yes. Where about is the villa in the Herculaneum site? Uh, it's to the northwest of Herculaneum. Separate from the main township? Yes, it's separated from the main township. There's a, there's a small like, gu a gully or river valley that, uh, that runs between the two. So it's slightly outside the main town. How far? Um, 50 metres, 100 metres. Not very far. Stones through. A stone's throw. Yes, yeah, all right. Talking about lengths of strings, stone's throw, <laughs> let's have the moment. <laughs> okay, I think at that point we will bring the, uh, the live casting to an end. Um, and we will, and we should um, thank Sarah once again for a talk, but there will be opportunities for informal interrogation. Um, <laughs>